This is Star Talk Sports Edition. I'm your host, Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist. And this week, we decided to visit our archives just from a few years ago, back to a discussion that be has become prevalent in the sports sphere over the past few years, and that's gender in sports. My co-host, Chuck Nice and Gary O'Reilly, they originally recorded this episode back in 2018 when Castor Semenya, an intersex woman with naturally high testosterone levels, was scrutinized for her winning performance as a runner. So since then, this conversation has continued to garner public attention. Various laws are being proposed to limit transgender and intersex athletes in how they can participate in sports. And and that the fact that laws are being discussed means this is a topic of consideration. And as for the Tokyo Olympics, athletes such as the New Zealand weightlifter and transgender woman, Laurel Hubbard, is sparking important conversations. And we thought it'd be valuable to bring back this archival episode. So we hope you enjoy this examination of the science of gender and how our expanding knowledge of human physiology might help us think more objectively about our society and what we deem to be fair in modern sports. Check it out. I think we have a particularly interesting guest joining us now. Dr. Joanna Harper is a transgender and gender variant athlete, an endurance runner, a medical physicist at Providence Portland Medical Center in Oregon, and the only person in history, Chuck, to publish a peer-reviewed article on the performance of transgender athletes. Welcome to the show. Um, okay, Joanna, let's start with a few of the vocabulary and terminology, so as I understand. So if we go through exactly what transgender, intersex, biological, and anatomical sex, and how this all unfolds, if you could base that for my platform to work from, please. Both sex, the biology of the male-female divide, and gender, the sociology of the male-female divide, are complex. Mm. And um, we can divide uh, biological sex in, into different categories like um, external genitalia, internal genitalia, chromosome pattern, uh, hormones, uh, secondary sex characteristics. And these are not all necessarily concordant. Um, so, you know, some people might possibly have external genitalia of one sex and, and internal genitalia uh, assorted with the, the opposite sex. Mm -hmm. um, gender is, is also complex. Um, many people nowadays talk about gender fluidity that implies a one-dimensional continuum between male and female. But I actually like to think of gender as a two-dimensional graph uh, in which we have male, female along a vertical axis, and then a number of gender aspects along the uh, horizontal aspect. And, and um, in particular with sports, I, I like to think of gender assigned at birth, social gender, legal gender, and, and a concept that I like to call athletic gender. Um, others have used terms like sports sex, um, but, but we're talking about the same thing, gender for the purpose of sport. And, and so um, so these things are complex, but um, I think we can narrow this down in terms of sports. You did warn Very us cool. it was complex. Um, <laughs> you, you have advised the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, on guidelines regarding sex reassignment and hyperandrogenism. Um, the athlete that springs to mind is Semenya, but I think we're going to get a little bit more in depth with that later on when we talk. But all right, are athletes, here we go, simple question, are athletes being gender tested at the Olympics right now? Uh, in the 2016 and 2018 Olympics, there, there was no testing. Anyone who had been assigned female at birth was allowed to compete in 2016 and 2018. Whether there will be some sort of test for 2020 remains to be decided. Okay. Is there a blanket ruling as the IOC, the IAAF, the International Athletics Association, if, if I remember it, Federation, and the NCAA, all of these large governing bodies, do they have the same rules or are they all varied? They all vary. Um, the Certainly the IAAF and, and the IOC coordinate 
but but they haven't always had the same rules. Um, and the NCAA is a completely different uh, organization with its different set of rules. But uh, in the last seven or eight years, all three of these organizations have have come to uh, center around the idea that hormones uh, are, are the most important aspect for determining who gets to compete in, in the male or female categories. So they're looking at hormones and what are they proposing or is there any kind of universal uh, uh, proposition being um, put forward to create a standard and should there be? Well, I, um, I guess first question first. Um, the NCAA since uh, 2011 has used a testosterone-based standard for transgender athletes. Um, intersex athletes are not a big concern uh, in the NCAA uh, because the, the prevalence in North America is, is, is less and, and, and there are other complicating factors, but, but most of the NCAA just has to concern themselves with transgender. The IAAF and the IOC both have to consider intersex and transgender, and they have separate policies for each of these. Um, as I say, the um, IOC has not had a policy on intersex athletes since uh, the 2014 Olympic Games. The IOC has uh, a transgender policy that has been in place since 2011. Uh, they have a new um, DSD regulations that, that uh, govern intersex athletes uh, that will start to uh, take uh place in November 1st of 2018, so just a few weeks from now. Um, so the second thing, should they all be the same? Well, not necessarily. I, I think I, I think we should look at elite athletes differently than we look at low-level athletes. But but I think the NCAA is, is high enough uh, a level of sport that, that they should probably be fairly close. Okay. And can you do me a favor? Because as you were talking about intersex athletes, I'm sure that there's a, a goodly portion of the listening audience that's not familiar with that. And um, in doing so, maybe visit the fact that this, ha everybody thinks that this is a very new, and uh, uh, even though it's very nuanced, it really isn't a new thing. I mean, this has a very long history going back to the Olympics in like, what, the 30s, right? Yes, and, and certainly intersex people before then, you know, in, in the 19th century, you had bearded ladies, you, you had yes. uh, the, these sorts of things. Um, so intersex people who have either physical and or chromosomal characteristics that in some manner blur the uh, line between male and female. Until the 21st century, these people were generally called uh, hermaphrodites. Hermaphrodites, and, right. Um, so, so many people might be more familiar with that. And, and intersex people, their conditions are called DSDs or differences of sexual development. Uh, so I use the term intersex and DSD uh, in interchangeably, uh, but, um, but many people might be more familiar with hermaphrodite. And so when when we're talking about let's kind of transition because uh, to transgender and you wrote an article. Uh, let me get the, the title right because I read it and it was in the Washington Post and it said, do transgender athletes have an edge? And then you said in the title, I sure don't. Now, I read that article and I have to say that the. The uh, title is somewhat misleading because people, I'm sure, will kind of maybe cruise through it or read in a cursory fashion or just read the headline and think that you feel there is no advantage whatsoever for being transgender and competing. But I read the article. That's not what you're saying at all. You're not saying that. So please, for those people who might not understand what you're really saying, can you clear it up for them? Absolutely. First of all, organizations like the Washington Post have people who write titles for them. Yes. And, and, yes. And and you, I'm sure you know that. So I wrote the article. Somebody else wrote the headline. And, and, and anybody who reads the article, this is why I'm bringing this up. If you read the article, you realize that somebody slapped a headline on there to make you read the article. But the headline and the article are really not in sync. So can you just tell us when it comes to advantages, what you really feel? I don't want to put words in your mouth. I read the article, but I don't want to put words in your mouth. And just let people know what you're really saying. Okay, so... 
most people are concerned about transgender women, people who start life as biologically male and then transition to female competing in women's sports. And, and many people say that trans women have advantages over normal women or cisgender women. And, and that's actually true. Um, even after hormone therapy, which makes enormous differences, but even after hormone therapy, transgender women are on average taller, bigger, and stronger than cisgender women. And in many sports, those are advantageous. Um, however, transgender women also have a large frame that they're now trying to power with reduced muscle mass and reduced aerobic capacity. So, so that's a disadvantage. So trans women have advantages, but disadvantages too. And then the most important question is, can transgender women and cisgender women compete against one another in an equitable and meaningful fashion? If they can, they belong in the same category. If they can't, they don't belong in the same category. It's interesting well put, when, you, well put. when we look at your personal journey because you're an endurance runner and it's all about I don't need the weight, I don't need this extra thing to drag this long distance. Are you saying that when you went through your process that it became particularly disadvantaged to you? And if so, can you explain the processes that you went through and the disadvantages that came with it? Muscle mass still helps transgender athletes. And as a trans woman, I carry more muscle mass than, than, than cisgender women. And, and so that helps. But, but certainly the fact that, um, you, you know, I, I mean, I'm not a huge person, but by female distance runner standards, I'm, I'm you know, a, a bigger, bigger than average. And, and so, you know, that is a disadvantage. And, and so what I found in my particular case is that after nine months of hormone therapy, I was running 12% slower. And that's the difference between um, male distance runners and female distance runners. So I had lost that advantage uh, over 12 months, or over nine months, rather. And, mm -hmm. and then I started finding other transgender distance runners, and the same thing had happened to them. And, and that made the basis of my study. But, but in particular, if you want to look really closely at it, when I was running in men's competition, my best event was the marathon. So the longer the race, the better I did. But that's mm -hmm. actually no longer true. My best race distances as a woman are 5K to 10K. And, and that bespeaks of, of my advantage of a little more muscle mass, but my disadvantage of having a little more uh, frame. And, and so um, I'm still pretty good at longer distances, but I, I'm now best at, at 5K to 10K. So there's been a little shift. It's interesting. So now you, you, you talk and discuss this. Is there a, a sort of specific events that would benefit some that don't, some that do the advantage-disadvantage scenario within sports and different sports? Absolutely. One, one would expect um, basketball, volleyball, weightlifting, um, those sorts of sports you might think would be sports where transgender women would have advantages. In um, gymnastics, transgender women are, are going to be hugely disadvantaged, so disadvantaged, in fact, that I predict that I will never live to see an elite uh, trans woman gymnast, never. Wow. So now when you talk about, and I would say, um, maybe you can speak to this or not, and maybe you've come across this in your studies or not, but I will say that when it comes to games then that uh, require both uh, – hand-eye coordination, skill sets, and strength that you really have, I mean, you really can't say that there's an advantage to being a transgender or not because you still have to have the skill set. You still have to have the hand-eye. These are things that are developed through causing neurons to fire together and wire together in such a way that you become super proficient at a particular action. Um, am I right in thinking that there's no real advantage? You say basketball. I believe that a female, just, you know, a biological uh, anatomical female could uh, compete the same way as a male could in certain positions on a basketball court. Or am I crazy for thinking this way? Well, you know, you, you're not likely to see a biological female in the NBA. Um you know, so 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 there is is certainly something to the male female divide, but but if you're looking at, at transgender women, on on average they're four or five inches taller, 
which which okay. is certainly an advantage. That's an but, advantage. But I would say that uh, that transgender women, and it's really hard to quantify this, but I I am certain that transgender women are quickness disadvantaged with respect yes. to other women. And, and, and so does does this balance out? Well, you know, there are no transgender women in the WNBA, so it's hard right. to say for sure. But but yeah. I, I don't think even in basketball that that trans women are so advantaged as as to make uh, competition unreasonable. And and that's that's my point is that, you know, there are so many other variables involved that mm-hmm. you can't flatly say, oh, Hey, you have this great advantage because you're transgender. You, uh, you know, that's all. I think a lot of this is political, and a lot of it has to do with social bias more so than an actual uh, empirical representation of true advantage. But I, I'm going on record as saying that is an opinion. <laughs> so, so I can't, you know, that's my opinion. Okay. And and you you know you're right. There are a lot of people. Who, who still think of transgender people being really the, the sex they were assigned at birth or the yes. gender they were assigned at birth. And, and so a lot of people think trans women are really men who are pretending to be women. And that's where they have a problem. And, and so they, they think of men invading women's sports. But trans women, certainly in terms of gender identity, I mean, trans women are not faking who they are. Nobody would go through all the things that transgender people have to go through just to succeed in sports. Yeah. And, you know, that's a wonderful thing you just said there. Exactly. Nobody's going through all of this to uh, truly uh, acknowledge their real identity just so that I can win a medal <laughs> or a trophy. <laughs> I'm sorry, but it's, I, I'm with you on that one. I'm just listening to Joanna there. And you spoke in your article in the Washington Post about fear, the fear of other athletes. And you said, oh, we don't mind you competing as long as you don't beat us. Is that just born out of pure ignorance? Um, you know, I, I, I don't want to, to label people to, but, um, you know, I, I think if, if people have a chance to compete uh, closely with and against transgender athletes, you know, uh, this sort of fear will go away. And, and, you know, as a runner, I have good years and bad years and good years and, and good races and bad races. And people who have raced against me a lot. They understand that, that some days they'll beat me and some days they won't. And, and, and so, um, you know, we're, we're athletes like anyone else. So is there anything that can be done by any of these organizations, sanctioning bodies or governing bodies that um, can make inclusion easier? And are they looking to make inclusion easier or is this really just a political football that must be handled? You know, the the primary job of sports governing bodies is to govern sports. Um, And, and, you know, inclusion is, is not their primary goal. But, okay. but, you know, yes, they, they do have a certain responsibility to, you know, to try to be inclusive as long as they can maintain equitable and meaningful competition within whatever categories they have determined are appropriate for their sport. And, and so are there things they can do? Yes. And, um, you know, the, the NCAA has, has certainly made an effort um, the international governing bodies, the IAAF and the IOC, they're working on it. They, they, you know, they've got a ways to go, but um, they have both an intersex athlete and a transgender athlete among 12 uh, worldwide experts that help advise them on this. And that's pretty good representation right there. And, and we're working on things. That's good. That's good to know. And, and you know, you, you have such a very... I will say measured and level-headed approach to this whole thing. You know, I'm, I quite admire the way you approached and broached the subject matter because for some reason this in, in, uh, incites a very passionate and emotional response from so many people. 
You know, one that I don't get, maybe it's because I've never been a real athlete. You know what I mean? Aside from playing some intramural sports in school, I, I you know, I, I don't know what it's like to have like, you know, to feel like everything's on the line or whatever. So I'm not sure. But it's it just really incites not only from players, but also from the public, this incredibly like passionate, fiery response. And, you know, I'm just a little I'm a I'm not as good at understanding that. It's interesting, Joanna, when we talk about where the answers might come from and what things are beginning to take place to find the the right path forward. We have currently Kester Semenya, who I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, is considered to be hyperandrogenist. Can you explain that to me so as I don't tread all over it and make the mistake yeah. of thinking it's, it's one it's thing or the other? It's a handful of a word, first of all. But, but it is. So for me, it is. <laughs> yes, it, it means someone um, with uh, naturally high levels of uh, androgynous hormones, and testosterone is, is the most common an androgen that we know of. Uh -huh. So um, <clears throat> the thing... Um, and, and if you look at the new IOC or the IAAF rules, they actually have gone away from calling them hyperandrogenism rules. They're now called DSD regulations. And I think that's a better term because there are um, there are things like uh, polycystic ovary syndrome that can cause uh, hyperandrogenism in females. Not not as high level as, as having testes. But um, uh, so so. Talking about the various DSDs that they do in the new IAAF regulations, I think is a step forward. But hyperandrogenism is a natural level of uh, high testosterone. And in the restricted athletes, that comes from having internal testes. There are some of these DSDs or intersex conditions where a person can be born with external female genitalia, but internal testes. And some, but not all of these people, when they go through uh, puberty, go through very much a male-type puberty where they get pretty much full male advantage. Now, not, not all of, of these intersex people do, but some do. And, and, and this is, is the, the problem for sports. You know, this person has been born, was declared female at birth, raised female, and then goes through male puberty. What do you do with that person? Here's what I want to know about that, though. Um, when you talk about, I'm not with the DSD. Why is it that that's never an issue when it's male and male? Like there are some men who are just naturally superior physical specimens, and no one says anything about it. With I, I point with without any compunction to LeBron James. You look at LeBron James on a court, and LeBron James is physically superior to everyone on the court. You can visibly see it. You can see it. No one says, well, the only reason he's good is because he's naturally, he's got a natural advantage. Nobody says that because they know what, how, what kind of work goes into getting there. So why is it that we focus only on females with this? I mean, I don't, I'm, I'm trying to figure that out, you know, and why is it okay for men to have a natural advantage, but for females not to have a natural advantage? Okay, so we divide athletes into male and female categories. And we do so because men are hugely advantaged in almost every sport. So we want women to win things like Olympic gold medals. Um, but there is no Superman category. If there was, LeBron James would belong in that Superman category. But, but we don't have one of those categories. We have a male category. We have a female category. And we have to find some way of dividing uh, human beings into male and female athletes. Um, so that's why there's no upper category for LeBron James, uh, Usain Bolt, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, but we do have uh, a female category and a male category. And so we need to, to pick some way to differentiate. And, and I would suggest that using the appearance of external genitalia at birth is not the ideal way to do it, but for the purpose of sport. But that's how we divide human beings uh, at, at birth. You know, we, we divide them by that, uh, the appearance of external genitalia. But 
in terms of sport, it's not optimal. So let, speaking of that, because we're almost out of time, and this is fascinating, and you're so great at talking about it and educating people. So uh, that being said, what would be a prescription? I'm not asking you to solve this problem right now, but is are there any ideas? Are there any um, um, efforts? What would be the prescription um, that, that you feel might help this uh, problem along? What I would suggest is that we use an evidence-based method that relies on a biomarker that is an important differentiator of male versus female athleticism uh, and is mostly dimorphic. Um, testosterone com- uh, fills all those boxes, but we'd like to come up with something better than testosterone. We are starting to do some pretty exciting studies. Um, uh, we are currently studying two transgender athletes, one in the, the Denver area, one in the Phoenix area, as they transition. And we are learning a lot. And we very much hope to have these studies going around the world in the next few years. And, and I think we can learn a lot. And I think we can come up with better biomarkers in the future. So, Joanna, uh, as we sit here in sort of like beginning mid-October 2018, next month, the I. Double AF will introduce new testosterone ruling, which, correct me if I'm wrong again, will see athletes with higher levels of testosterone being put into a medication program that lowers that. And, and, and they focus, strangely enough, on the 400 meters, the 800 meters, and the 1500 meters, which happens, surprisingly enough, to be Case de Semenya's particular chosen field of track events. How has the world reacted to that? Well, many people have been reacted very negatively. Um, You know, um, those events were chosen not because they're Castor Semenya's events, but because those are, uh, A, events which a, a 2017 study undertaken by a couple of scientists showed advantage uh, for higher testosterone levels. And B, these are the events that over the last 25 years uh, have shown uh, that intersex women have a huge advantage. Um, I have a paper that's just been accepted for publication and there's like 15 co-authors. But okay. one of the things we looked at was how do intersex women do in those events over the last 25 years? And we found that they had a 1,700-fold over-representation in those restricted events at global track and field championships over the last 25 years. So it's not just Castor Semenya. No, oh, thank you for, for pointing that out. Is, very good. Is the IWF action the best way forward or... Is there a glaringly obvious other path that can be taken? Um, (laughs) I'm not certain it's the right way forward. Um, I'm not certain it isn't. Um, Castor Semenya, it appears, is going to challenge those rules in the Court of Arbitration for Sport. And we will see what we will see. Absolutely, we will. Oh, my God. This is fascinating stuff, but we are out of out of time unfortunately and hopefully maybe um we can just revisit this as a um kind of like a a, a a a epilogue so we can after after the trial and all the hearings and other maybe we'll be able to get you back on and just kind of revisit this if you don't mind no no i i would be happy to do so after the trial that's very generous of because this is a this is a moving thing. This thing is going to move forward, and I think we need to keep uh, ourselves acutely aware of it. So, Dr. Joanna Harper, thank you so much for your insight and your patience with Chuck and I, and explaining some very simple things to us. Thank you very much indeed. You're welcome. And they're not simple at all. You're very yeah, generous, well, as you. I said. Thank you. All right, Chuck. Um, every day's a school day, my friend. Yes, it is. And I'm glad today I actually paid attention in class. <laughs> I think we all are. And uh, we'll look forward to your company on the other side. Thanks for participating in this episode we pulled from the archives from back in 2018. I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist and your host of Star Talk Sports Edition. As always, keep looking up. <laughs>